So my teeth Pull up on a nigga with a scope, make him shake her 97 bullets, no fitness Ain't hard, jump man, jump man, 23 play hard Sweet ass nigga, you belong in the gay bar I ain't took your bitch Welcome back boys to Large Lads episode 17 um, We will include a penguin in the next intro to the guy who keeps requesting it um, But it didn't fit this one Yeah, uh, to the guy who's been asking for the uh, penguin included in the intro We have heard your request <laughs> I've selected a clip. It just didn't fit into this one. Uh, I take a lot of pride in these intros, and I spend way too long working on them. I think I can fit it into next week's one and still have it like fit with the theme of our intros. Yeah, so it's got a real canon developing. So today's topic is uh, jock mode and dork mode lifting trends, which just kind of means like whether or not we think they were productive and good for the the. The gym as a whole. Also, I've just thought of one that I'm adding. This okay. All right. Make sure you guys uh, harass Max on his Instagram. I'll put it in God. the description. Uh, he said to ask you guys for your viewer questions. Read them and was like, never mind. We're just going to do Jock Mode Dork Mode again. <laughs> you know, I, I know what the fans really want. And I think the fans really the want The fans it. don't know what they want. Yeah. They just want us to say <laughs> Jock Mode Dork Mode over They love over. just us announcing things are good as bad. Dogmatically. All right, large lad viewers opening always, as always, jock mode. So sorry for ignoring bunch all of, questions. Bunch of chads yeah. with questions that Max thinks are trash. <laughs> you know, the fact that you guys still watch these means the world. <laughs> uh, cluster deadlifts. That's been a real thing lately. Yeah. Um, and I've kind of hopped on the bandwagon. Um, so jock mode. Um, they've made my back feel better because I've been dealing with a, the weird uh, ongoing back injury. It's like not even an injury. It's more of a tweak. And we've just found my first rep just feels so much better that I just started doing cluster sets. I felt kind of lame hopping on like a IPF trend, but also it was just so much better for like me rehabbing my back. And I was embarrassed to hop on it, but they're going well. Um, yeah, clusters are an interesting one because clusters have been around for a very long time. Like you can go back to like lifters in like the 60s. Writing up cluster de like centered programs for bench squat and deadlift. Like Josh Bryant has been done a bunch of like strength history things on guys that were huge on cluster method, right? Mm -hmm. um, you go, I don't know, 2010, 2012 kind of era. You had Matt Gary writing a lot about singles only deadlift programming, which kind of is cluster adjacent, mm -hmm. where he would just say like, hey, uh, you know, there's an inherent specificity to the first rep. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. We should comprise our volume of like shorter rest interval singles for like 25 minutes. Yeah. Right. Um, Matt Gary, also a uh, former head coach of the uh, USAPL national team, lives here in uh, Bozeman. Yeah. Right, that's true. Near, right next to our gym. So that's cool. Um, but they've been around forever. Right now, they're kind of having another resurgence. Yeah. Uh, I know Lane Norton was using them for a while way back when he was like kind of prominent within the USAPL. Mm -hmm. Now he's prominent just as like a big famous guy. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that they have tons of upsides in that inherent specificity, right? Like mm -hmm. very, 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 very common for lifters to have a better second rep than first rep yeah. uh, because they have the negative to find their start position mm -hmm. and they're pre-tensioned. Yeah. So being able to recreate that tension, mm -hmm. very good. I think there's a lot of people, like any trend, yeah. there's going to be people who are horribly misusing it and be like, dude, I just crushed my all-time double PR with like what could barely even be called a cluster anymore. Yeah. Where like they do a single, rest like two fucking minutes. Yeah. They trim the, they cut the video. It jumps. I was going to say that was how much time passed in between there. And they're like massive 40 pound double PR. And it's like, is this actually a good training effect? Or yeah. is this just a way for you to artificially overcome your plateau? But, you know, I'm always big on, like, if there's something you engage, like, it's the same thing with, like, any methodology. Engage with the smart people doing it well, yeah. not the dummies doing it badly, because yeah. you can just straw man any method. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I definitely, now that I've, I've done, you know, two months of cluster uh, sets, uh, I've, one, noticed, like, okay, our reps haven't been, like, ahead of where I have been on like a normal set. Yep. Like we're, we're, we're like getting close, but also there has not been like a notable jump. Like if there is a notable jump, that might be something to look at. Like, okay, my, are my rest times really suspiciously long? Mm -hmm. Like I've just been looking at like total length of the video and being like, okay, how long was this? Is this like an insane amount of length for it to do five reps? Yeah. If it's like eight minutes long, that's five singles, not, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 
not it's a not a cluster set anymore. It's which like limited doing. rest interval. Like, yeah, which is also about like yeah. Imam deadlift work, long history also of people implementing it well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I talked to Chris Bridgeford a while ago and he mentioned inverting your volume. Mm -hmm. Just taking like, hey, if you were gonna do three sets of eight reps, yeah. take the exact same weight mm -hmm. and do eight triples mm -hmm. on a more moderate rest interval. That mm -hmm. way you get more first reps. Right. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different ways to tackle that bad second rep thing and build more first reps in your training. Yeah. I think clusters are a great option uh -huh. and you could absolutely build a phenomenal training system around them. I think like anything else, you're seeing high performers use them who yeah. have kind of topped out their weight class and muscle. They're not as concerned with just traditionally building volume. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. um, a good example of like that is just like these, these kind of modern USAPL training models where you're training a bit heavier on average, mm -hmm. like you're running through a four week block of triples, doubles, or singles, mm -hmm. um, and hitting like these big comp, like big comp total across the week or in a singular SBD day. Yeah. Very good for guys who have already built up a base of volume, mm -hmm. but maybe not the most effective training when compared to like traditional periodization yeah. and doing your eights and your tens and then your fives for guys who need to fill out their frame. It's mm -hmm. part of why, Adam, I know you watch these. I think it's why Adam had so much success mm -hmm. going from like a very traditional American block periodization, uh -huh. did a ton of volume, built a massive base as a bigger guy, mm -hmm. and then switched over to a cr touching heavier, more often model of yeah. like, yeah, we're gonna run through a four week phase ending with top triples, doubles, or singles. Yeah. So we're practicing the skill of lifting heavy a lot more often, mm -hmm. which does take away some of your mental energy to do really rigorous bodybuilding work. Yeah. But if the base has already been built, that's valid. But the, the problem is people see like Bob. Yeah. People see guys who- doing a lot of accessories also, isn't it? True. People see these guys that do train heavier a greater percentage of the year and don't oh. realize it's already because they have put a lot of muscle onto their frame relative to the people that are comparing themselves. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like the classic, like uh, what you did to get there versus what you do now. Because mm -hmm. it's like, and I could John Hack gaining a bunch of extra muscle is gonna hurt his performance because it should make his water cut worse at this point. Yeah. So like just getting more efficient is like really what he needs to do. Yeah, as but long if as he wants to be able to make 198 still, it's yeah. like, yeah, there's not a ton of utility into plugging in like crazy amounts of volume. Yeah, doing a bunch of like uh, crazy amount of tricep extensions, like probably is not gonna be like the priority when it's just like you're bound to a weight class. But if you're like a 170 pound teenager or, uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, someone with a lot of uh, room to grow, it's like the amount of volume you need to be doing is going to be different from someone who's bound to a weight class at an elite level. For sure. I could, I don't really, I, that's kind of the thing with clusters is I could see them easily being misused because there's something fun. Yeah. And like, yeah, sure. I don't think your 5RM would actually go up that much for a lot of people if they, if they're good at like kind of the cone style, grab a breath of air at the top, control yeah. the negative, let it sink into the ground so it's dead stop and then mm -hmm. pull again. If you're good at that, I don't think you'll inflate your like 6RM too much. Yeah. You can make a big difference in your 2 or your 3. Yeah. You know, and so it's like, you know, there's a temptation there, but overall, I think it's good, mm -hmm. you know? And it's weird to say like jock mode, but it's it's a good tool. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's the jock mode. <laughs> also, you know what? Let me tell you guys something that's jock mode. You know what I hate? I hate fucking porch pirates. I think that uh, you, this, uh, this is actually how we're Jock mode or dork mode? Who, the porch pirates or me hitting them with a fucking bat? Okay. <laughs> I hate those motherfuckers. This is actually how I'm gonna blow up the channel is I'm just gonna live stream like a full Looney Tunes style setup of me putting a bait box in front of our house and just standing there behind something with a bat and fucking clocking someone. So the real issue Single is mom trying to steal my fucking package. Maybe I'll be nice, hit him in the arm. This is fucking bullshit, don't steal my packages. This is gonna be used in court one day. Absolutely. <laughs> As like, this is absolutely, absolutely. premeditated, this is a trap. Yeah, and they're gonna select a jury of my peers, so a bunch of fucking chads, and they're gonna say, wow, jock mode, that's hilarious. I, What's your Twitch? <laughs> it's also really funny, I feel like uh, this has been, uh, back in Tacoma, we had a lot of packages stolen. We had stolen. a lot of packages stolen. We haven't actually had one stolen here, I don't think. I've got one <laughs> that's kind of MIA right now, but I don't think it was stolen. I think it's, the post office doesn't know where we live. Yeah. But like back in Tacoma, we had a bunch stolen. I was ready to go to jail. I was ready to be locked up for the next 10 years if I caught one of these motherfuckers. We did also have like a perfect like nook beside our I, door. Yeah, like hiding there. <laughs> a perfect uh, porch fire thwacking uh, station. Um, I took the mailman. <laughs> Our roommate, right, next one, next roommate one. with our dog. Uh, belt cleans and strongman. Um, I have limited thoughts because I'm not in strongman, but I yeah, think residents. I think it's very illogical that belt cleans aren't allowed. You're allowed to wear figure eights. You're allowed to wear a deadlift suit. You're allowed to wear a squat suit. You're allowed to hitch. You're allowed to get your overhead above your head by any means necessary, but you can't make it 
contact with your belt. It doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. Uh, there's, a, there's a good bit of evidence to suggest that the first lifting belts were actually invented to put the barbell on for like old timey circus strongmen. I think that's where the term clean comes from. If you got it up to your shoulders without putting it on your belt, it was called a clean lift, a clean, right? Um, so it makes no sense in the history of like circus strongman. That's why the belts even came about, mm -hmm. that that's not allowed. I think a lot of it really is just kind of gatekeeping. It's a bunch of uh, guys who are in the sport early. This rule kind of arbitrarily came about. They had a bunch of reps disallowed because their axle clean touched their belt. Mm -hmm. And they don't want, like, they're like, well, I had to suffer through this so the next generation of strongman can't have it easy. I, I was red lighted for this so many times, blah, blah, blah. You can't either, instead of asking if the rule was really important in the first place. Yeah. And I kind of think it artificially puts a gap between lighter weight classes and the open guys because mm. um, the open guys have a gut and so they're able to do a non-belt continental a little bit better. Mm. I think it artificially puts a gap between them. Mm. Which really, if you look at like the lighter weight classes with having like a proficient split jerk, they're putting weights that are like concerningly close to the open guys over their head with their mm. better technique, but you're limiting them kind of artificially with their clean almost. I'm not a fan. I think it kind of evens the playing field. Just everybody can put it on their belt. Fair enough. We cheat in every other way possible. Why not? You know? So banning uh, belt cleans, dork mode. <laughs> belt cleans in general, pretty fucking cool. Jock mode. All right. Belt cleans in general, jock mode. All right. Uh, I'm sure somebody's going to disagree with me on that. I just don't get it. Yeah. Dips. Um, kind of a little bit of a trendy thing in powerlifting for a moment. Uh, jock mode. Just in general, I think. Uh, yeah. Overall, obviously, people cannot like hyper-specialize and make them... Uh, less productive for like a bench carryover and can get too good at them. But in general, very good accessory jock mode. Yeah, some people take them too far. Some people start using street lifting technique, which nothing wrong with street lifting technique, but that's the technique to move. Like that's like, it's the same thing as like arching your bench press, right? We're trying within the rules of a competition to maximize a result, not trying to maximize the training effect of the lift. Yeah. Right? Because it's like, let's say you're a, let's say you're a bench guy. You're a bench specialist, just hypothetically for right. simplicity, right? A weightlifter doesn't compete in the high bar squat. Mm -hmm. but it's a motion that correlates really well with the physical characteristics of a good weightlifter. Yeah. So we do a lot of it. Yeah. You could make an argument dips are very similar They're Yeah. We don't compete in the dip, mm -hmm. but dips build the physical characteristics that tend to correlate with a good bench press. Mm -hmm. So we do, we do some dips, yeah. right? The difference is just like the weightlifters, they're like, Oh, well squatting is useful. Well, squatting is useful if we use it in this way. That's like developmentally relevant. Mm -hmm. We're going to high bar deep squat. Mm -hmm. They're not like, okay, well, I'm going to move the bar lower and widen my stance and cut my depth Yeah. because, oh, squatting is good. Thus, I should squat in the way to move the most weight yeah. and not in the way for the developmental effect. Yeah. You can do the same thing with dips. You mm -hmm. really, really can. Yeah. You know? And uh, so I think that's one thing. That, like some people were like getting just so hell bent on like flexing their numbers on Instagram mm -hmm. that they were kind of missing the forest for the trees with the dips. Yeah. But that being said, I fully agree. Dips do correlate really well with the physical characteristics of a good bencher. Mm -hmm. They're like one of my absolute most common assistance work to prescribe. Mm. What are you smiling? What are you smirking about? Uh, I just thought of another one. Okay. Uh, wearing you a smirk, your idea is so good. <laughs> it's so it's good. Got this little shitty wearing thing. a mask in the gym, uh, like TikTok style. The most dork mode thing I've seen. Hold on, you clarify what kind of mask. This sounds very different than what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> like a Halloween, spirit Halloween, like Jason mask on like these a guys, Wednesday. These guys deadlifting in like spooky <laughs> <laughs> costumes. <laughs> Delving in costume, whatever. Like that was that's been around forever. It's like yep. her, her, I'm dressed up as a banana. Look at my deadlift. Yep. Right. The guys who wear like scary masks and then like scream and deadlift and post it on TikTok. Potentially the most dork mode thing we have ever covered. I we're gonna we got one that later in this one that might compete. Holy fuck, I had never heard of this until you showed Yeah. Max shows me I don't know anything about TikTok. I don't really watch reels, I don't watch anything like that. So uh, Max generally shows me, for a while actually, I used to have a very positive opinion of TikTok because the only ones I would see would be ones Kirsten would show me because she knew I would think they're funny. So I was like, oh man, everybody on TikTok is so funny. Yo, and then Max started being like the antagonist here and showing me nothing but shit he knew I would fucking hate. And he showed me this shit of like some guy wearing a mask and like yelling and everybody glaring at him. He's like, they're miring me. Like, wow, that hurt me. That hurt me badly to watch. 
I'm like, I think I'm really susceptible to like huge selection biases. Yep. Like I think Australian people are chads yep. because the only Australian people I ever hear from regularly yep. is like Rob Whitaker and Volkanovsky, Sebastian Oreb, yep. and then my client Caspian. <laughs> Who maybe Caspian's not quite as much of a stud as those other guys. The great, no, wait, he's a large last viewer. We confirmed jock mode. He, he has a question later on in this that we're going to cover. No. Uh, but Caspian has the greatest mindset of any man to ever live. Like his spreadsheet, my, like his notes at the bottom, the best part of coaching for me. Just like <laughs> took an hour long poo, amazing session, was the perfect warm up. Like this guy, Australian people. I don't think any of them are bad. I think they're all genius. They're all good. There's, there's eight of them. And they're two of them are Vulcan. They're all <laughs> supreme winners, dude. Uh, wave same with, I think the same thing of like French Canadian people, just because of like JF Caron and, and GSP. Uh, GSP. I'm just like they're all bald chads. They've got an entire. How have they not conquered us yet? Because yeah, there's five of them. <laughs> two of them. <laughs> if they're all just those guys, they could probably conquer us. Uh, wave loading. So wave loading. In a singular session refers to like ramping, dropping the weight, ramping, dropping the weight for a couple of waves. That's not what I was talking about wave loading specifically that we're talking about is like a four week block wave load. Um, a very simple example of this might be like popular program 531 where it's like deload, rise, 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 deload, rise, rise, rise. Um, Steve Denovi even made a video where like, you don't have to do a deload. It could just be the lightest of the four. Mm -hmm. Light, heavy, 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 light, heavy, heavy, heavy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of modern powerlifting programming has moved more towards these four shorter blocks staying heavier a lot of the year mm -hmm. and moved away from kind of traditional block periodization, hypertrophy, strength, power, slash peak. Yeah. Um, again, I think it's very similar to the clusters. This is really, really good for guys who have filled out their weight classes already. Mm. Um, maybe doesn't free up quite as much time for volume as maybe newer lifters need to grow. Mm. Um, I think I'll just go net neutral on this. Net like neutral. you can see, I think that like, it's part of why the high level lifters are continuing to get better, yeah. right? Is It's just another part of implemented high specificity, but like implementing high specificities for late career really good lifters mm -hmm. implementing ultra high specificity a bunch of people have already made this point yeah cranking your specificity really high as a early intermediate it's a great way to like make some quick progress yeah. and then hit a nasty plateau yeah right cranking the fuck out of your specificity in general mm -hmm. is overrated right mm -hmm. um unless you're talking about like very specific sub demographics yeah. right so i don't know i think this modern like it's 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 a cool spin that i've definitely taken for my some of my strongest guys mm -hmm. like tyler the guy i coach um he did us 8.48 or something, 8.43. Huge deadlifter, very strong guy uh, to the point, and he's, he's tall, he's like six foot three. Mm -hmm. So he accrues fatigue very easily, mm -hmm. right? So it's like a traditional building volume type phase, kind of the same thing Nate observed, right? When you're moving your lifts that far, building volume is just so disproportionately fatiguing. Mm -hmm. We've moved him to more of that wave loading type scheme. Yeah. Whereas most of my lifters that aren't giant six foot three monsters yeah. are going to use more of a traditional 10 week block periodization, mm -hmm. right? But it's, it's, I think it's very good. I think it's the logical advancement of high level training. Mm -hmm. I just think, again, it falls, it's like super susceptible to the whole copying advanced lifters when you shouldn't. All right, neutral mode. Yeah, neutral mode. Okay, okay. Um, we got French low What's, bar. What, so it's dork mode, jock mode. We'll have to consult Kirsten. Yeah, yeah. Like what, what do you call the people that are neither dorks nor jocks. Normies. Normie mode. Normie mode. Normie mode. Normie mode you know? right. uh, That's probably what Kirsten would say too, damn it. <laughs> French low bar. Uh, L. <laughs> dork dork mode. mode. Bring back the Ed Cohn rule. We have a rule to stop it. We shouldn't have gotten rid of it. Don't put the bar that low. It looks lame. It looks stupid. <laughs> all these powerlifters being like, oh, well, it's within the rules. Blah, blah. The rules should reflect what looks cool. All right. Start yeah. using bumper. <laughs> well, if you like, yeah, I mean, the history of powerlifting, right? It was like, hey, uh, weightlifting is too technical. We want a contest to do kind of just pure brute strength. Yeah. So it's like you could make an argument, and this is, you know, I took a sports ethics class that I dorked out in. Yeah. And like, I was, I probably talked more than every single one of my classmates combined. Sick. Like I love that class yep. and it's like you have arguments about spirit of the sport versus rules as they're written. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well it's within the rules as they're written, but the spirit of the sport is this vague concept. There's yeah. like, there's rule unspoken rules in a lot of sports. Yeah. Right. So it's like, what is the spirit of the sport? 
at one point in time, the spirit of the sport was like, hey, we're not trying to bend the rules. Mm -hmm. We're trying to have a strength contest. Yeah, the test of strength. But then it became more of a sport. Yeah. And within the, when things become more of a sport, mm -hmm. not just a strength contest, mm -hmm. people are going to try to lift more within the rules, right? Yeah. And so it's like you could get in a bunch of things. I'm invoking spirit of the sport card. Yeah. Move that bar up higher. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, well, I think the rules. Coward. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Listen, you're being boring here. I, I'm. Uh, I'm just going to talk about <laughs> assaulting porch pirates and calling people cowards. Yeah. <laughs> I'm carrying this one between the intro. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Zoomers as a whole. <laughs> 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 Entire generation. <laughs> that includes Sam is technically a zoomer, aren't you? Yeah, I don't know. It depends on what you look up, right? No, he's a like, zoomer. He's a I've zoomer. been back and forth on this like a bunch of times. Okay. Because it's like you'll see the cutoff for like millennial moves a bunch. Mm -hmm. Some some things are like, oh, if you're born after like ninety-three, yep. you're a zoomer. Yep. It's like, yeah, I'm definitely born after ninety-three. Yep. And then the latest I can see is like nineteen ninety-nine or nineteen ninety-eight when uh -huh. I was born. Yep. So I'm like, I'm either just the youngest millennial of all of the millennials or uh -huh. I'm the oldest of the zoomers. Um, Which, Jesus Christ, that reminds me of Kirsten always calling herself an elder Zoomer. That is dork mode. <laughs> I love Kirsten. A, a rare mode. Uh... Yeah, the big dog, rare dark mode <laughs> moment from the big dog. Um, this is gonna, Speaking of Zoomer, something to touch on, right? Mm -hmm. You know what's been the most trendy thing in, in lifting? Sam Sulek. Uh, generally, uh, jock mode for the lifting community. I, I feel like I've seen an up, slight uptick in the average uh, work Dude, ethic of our local teenagers. Yeah, actually. They've they, been working hard. That's a tremendous point. Huge positive influence. My opinion of Zoomer gym goers. Yeah. Much better. It's really funny. Um, they all have grown out their hair and wear a baseball cap over it. Yep. Oh, wow. They like have a uniform. Uh -huh. uh, they were, they've they been working hard though. They <laughs> train, there's one guy at our gym. Seems like a really nice guy. Yep. He like saw me doing hammer curls the other day, uh -huh. and then stopped training like legs and started doing hammer curls. And I was like, "Fuck yeah, dude! Like that's that's so wholesome." <laughs> you know, I, I gotta say that does kind of bring me hope. Yeah, uh, dude. I was like, okay, there are there are because it's like, oh my god, like you see TikTok yep. and you see maybe the average guy, mm -hmm. and you're like, ooh, this is rough. The average but, TikTok lifter has been has been getting worse. The I problem think. though <laughs> is if you rewind, right? You're very comfortably a zoomer. Yeah, but if for you sure. rewind to when we started lifting, yeah, because you started lifting like way before the average person. Yeah, the average when we started was shit. It was some actual mongoloid in a beanie, yeah. like cussing out the front desk. Yeah, pretty, probably a little bit racist, really. <laughs> Vag vaguely racist, like loved George leaving a little bit too much, moved to Thailand with him potentially. Like pretty, honestly, the average back then, I think back on some of my interactions, also terrible. And it's just like, it's the one in 10 guys that stick this out past the five year mark yeah. that become like long time lifters. Yeah. Most of them from both are cool. Most yeah. of them. Honestly, some of the worst lifters I've ever met were from when we first started. I feel like, uh, you know, I, I assume our YouTube viewer probably has a very low opinion of Zoomer lifters, which is very understandable. But I will say, all of my time at local powerlifting competitions, even the like annoying modern powerlifter guys, they're still like generally like nice and respectful and like- Except for the dollar just... store wheeze. Okay, so there is someone at our gym that calls- <laughs> some... No, not, not Matt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you remember that guy? Yeah, I do. Oh, that guy was a dickhead. I will, okay, but that's like there's always that guy be, was a dickhead. There's always gonna be some bad ones. He'd for be sure. with, listen, don't worry. This is not a good he gentleman. He doesn't watch my channel. Of or course, be better at lifting weights. Yeah, of course. He just did all of his prep and straps and was like, "God, I got so unlucky. My callus tore on my hook grip. I was gonna break the American record though." And like he was like big dog and max the whole time. Very funny. <laughs> Super humorous. Which was insane. For I have pulled my two hundred pounds. Yeah, but he was, like, he was like ready for the American record. Do, do like, at best, you guys are peers. I, I, this is like a. <laughs> that was the same meet you were the youngest person to ever deadlift 800. And I got a big dog. <laughs> that guy, big dog, he was like, damn, just roll, a terrible roll of the dice. Just happened to tear my thumb. And it's like, did you, like, and we looked at his Instagram and he didn't do like a single preparation pull, bare hand. Uh, yeah, that was, that was rough. Cranking some pound plate sumo pulls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but generally, I feel like, you know, most local meat experiences I've had have been pretty Real positive. life is much more reassuring than the internet. Yeah, sure. yeah. I feel like the average pilot is a lot less lame Less than shit I than the internet would have to be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tempos. That was a real thing. Good. 
Yeah, jock mode. Jock mode. I I feel like also. Uh, I, I think almost everybody would refine their technique a little bit if they did sometimes some tempos. I've been doing it on some of my warm ups, and uh, I, I'm really productive. Just as a good like warm up technique tool, super super jock mode. Yeah. Um, just like practicing, it makes you feel your positions better. Just in general, obviously, like all of these, so it got taken too far by some people. But in general, pretty jock mode. Yeah, and I think it's like a bunch of stuff that we use, which yeah. is like as you've gotten more advanced, we have less because you're a super heavyweight. Mm -hmm. We don't have as many sets of squats and deadlifts to work with. Yeah. So it's like it's hard to use variations as much anymore. Mm -hmm. We have to use those variations as drills. Yeah. Right, and there's a different like you can use the same exercise either as a drill to work on technique when you're warming up mm -hmm. or on a light day, or you could go heavy on it and try to PR and use it as a variation. And there's a time and a place for both. Like you could use one and one half deadlifts or one and one half squats yeah. as a variation that you try to get stronger. But mm -hmm. for the most part, with max nowadays, we're using it as a drill, like you would like, hey, you know, you're throwing shot put. Yeah. We're gonna do is it South African? That's one yeah. of the really like common drills. Uh, it's one of them, yeah. Right, I'm just, I'm just trying to remember. It's a step in from half through, yeah. Yeah, it's like we're going to do a couple of those beforehand because it highlights a technical element we know you mess up. Yeah. Right? Maybe we aren't chasing the furthest South African possible. Yeah. We're just using it to fix some patterns mm -hmm. before we move into the competition movement. But there's also a time and a place to try to throw further from a stand. Because yeah. a throw from a stand is just a variation. Mm -hmm. It could be used as a drill or it could be something that's tracked and progressed. Yeah. Right? Um, earlier in training careers when someone's like, Example being, you bench press more often for a mm -hmm. lot more sets. Yeah. So we don't tempo only as a drill. We also tempo as a variation that we're actively trying to get stronger at. Well, I was gonna say uh, earlier on my training, career, I would do a uh, pause deadlift set before my regular yep. set. Like so definitely like sub max so I wasn't gassing myself out, but my like just my ability, like my total work capacity in comparison to my like max was just higher. Yeah. And so it's like as I've gotten farther, in my like the amount of sets. But like you know, if you're a, a, a less advanced lifter. Do some tempo sets. Well, right? the nice part, right, is like even if they're an advanced lifter, if they're not in a heavy weight class, yeah. you get a lot of sets. <laughs> to get better, you have a lot of sets to work with. Yeah. And you can implement small amounts of variation that it's like, hey, I'm still getting in my, I don't know, 15 sets of bench press a week that I need right in this phase to get better. Yeah. But I can also introduce a little bit of novelty to yeah. get some like novel gains. Mm -hmm. And I can also introduce that novelty to help me understand my bench press better. Yeah, well, so two instead of those 15, 15, yeah. Exactly. Well, instead of doing 15 sets of comp, yeah. maybe you could do three tempos in there to break up the monotony. You mm -hmm. could do three like dead to pins even, right? Mm -hmm. We can introduce a bunch of different variations to promote motor learning. All right, so general jock mode. Uh, we're definitely not going to finish this list yes, that we, we made. Let's go. <laughs> the whole list. All right, two and a half hour <laughs> uh, Functional slash corrective exercises. So I've seen this as really like um, to the Instagram group chat. Someone sent them like, "Oh, power lifters. Uh, oh, you should be doing. You're already doing a bunch of like isometric work for your midsection with your main lifts." your additional kind of work for your core midsection mm -hmm. should be things where we're moving because that's picking up what your main lifts did. Yeah. And then uh, similarly, like, oh, like rotational stuff for power lifters, that's kind of become trendy. Mm -hmm. Or uh, Shane Germain, one of the biggest coaches in Strongman, mm -hmm. he's, has all this like hippy dippy stuff, um, like corrective exercises, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like all of these things in isolation are mm -hmm. not very helpful. Right, mm. all of these things, if they're paired on top of doing the pretty standard heavy training, mm -hmm. can be really helpful. Mm. All of these things are really to address common kind of movement deficiencies, common imbalances that form mm. from the pretty basic heavy training mm. for either powerlifting or for strongmen. Mm. So these are very smart things if done on top of five years of. Mm. the actual main stuff. Yeah. The problem is that they're trendy and people care too much too early, mm. right? So it's like looking at that that core example. Mm. I don't see that many guys in the gym that are so good at creating rigidity in their torso yeah. that they it would be useless to do any planks afterward. Yeah. You're already you're already so good at creating rigidity in your torso. I see people folding up when they I, do, I still do planks in between my warm like yeah. all the time. It's like <laughs> well, so it's like, okay, well, it's clearly this this quality of creating rigidity isn't ahead of the curve yet. Yeah. Addition, like any assistance work, right? We can break down assistance work into muscles or we can break them into functions. Mm -hmm. That's a function. Yeah. You know, it's, if that's a weakness within your squat, as it is for many people, mm -hmm. we could do assistance work to target that function. Yeah. Right? I don't see an epidemic mm -hmm. of guys that are great at creating rigidity. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I do see that among guys who have made it eight years in, who are very, mm -hmm. really strong guys. There's a lot of guys that are really good at creating rigidity through their torso yeah. that can no longer bend. 
mm-hmm. or they can no longer twist. Mm-hmm. So keeping something in rotational, even if it's just a little bit, once a week, mm-hmm. can preserve that rotational ability mm-hmm. for just functionality as a human. Yeah. And it can also maybe mitigate injury risk because it's like if you get so good in this position, if hypothetically you found yourself right slightly outside of it, yeah. you have no strength whatsoever, mm-hmm. right? So it's like these things hold a ton of value, mm-hmm. but it's like when you post that, you have to realize that 95% of the people reading it aren't mm-hmm. advanced lifters, yeah. right? So it's like, yeah, it's true, but we also need to make sure that we're hammering home. This is on top of these other things. So yeah. I didn't actually agree with that core one because I think most people would benefit from like some ab rollouts. Mm-hmm. Uh, depending on how you do them, a GHD sit up is either an isometric or like an actual moving like spinal flexion exercise, mm-hmm. but like ab rollouts or planks. Mm. Almost everybody probably would benefit from those. Yeah. I don't agree at all. Now, could they, could they also benefit from some hanging leg raises and some twisty shit yeah. or some side bed? Yeah, sure. Um, so like the inclusion of rotation and Shane Germain stuff. It's like people have been, like Shane even actually addressed this on his story, right? And it was like, maybe you walked into it. Maybe you should have been like a little bit more like, hey, this is who for, this is, this is for these people in particular. Mm. But he's like, people are calling this hippy dippy stuff. I've been like I've been working with guys that have been doing strongman for like ten years that are wicked strong. Mm-hmm. I've made a lot of observations on what the common uh, like issues that arise mm-hmm. from just doing that strongman training. Whatever strongman training is, there's like powerlifting training, strongman training. Yeah. It's a vague thing. You develop loss of mobility here, so this is a good thing to prevent that. Mm-hmm. You'll develop blah 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 instability here. This yeah. is a good thing to prevent that. Mm-hmm. The problem is if you present those things to a bunch of weak guys, mm-hmm. they're probably going to spend too much time worrying about those things and not enough times spending actually getting strong in the first yeah. place. So I would say normie mode, kind of neutral, okay. because they're absolutely correct and these are good things to know. Mm-hmm. But you can't let that like you can't miss the forest for the trees in the first five years. That like really it comes down to like. First, let's kind of really work on creating that rigidity through the midsection. Yeah. You know, I, obviously I've got a lot of thoughts on it, but those mm. are, those are kind of, eh. it's a trend that I'm like, I see absolutely these people are correct, mm. but sometimes like you need to know your audience and include caveats yeah. because people might like take correct information and apply it to the wrong person. Well, that's kind of the hard part about making content is that like, uh, if yeah. you are always specifying who it's for, like the the audience, beca- or like your ability to like actually like create useful information goes down. Because like, I remember when you were first creating YouTube videos, you had like a major problem of like constantly having to like specify that you were like within like oh except for this this and this yeah. to like make sure you're not like giving like what so some some dork mode wouldn't come up like oh but actually what about this Dude, one hypothetical everybody thinks they're talking everybody, that's the me and paris were talking about this the other day yeah. everybody thinks you're talking to them yeah it's like i'm like hey, good mornings are good yeah and some guy's like actually i can't do good morning i wasn't talking to you dude this is a video trying to guesstimate how to talk to like 1500 to 2000 people yeah i was not talking to you if you can't do them, that is fine. Like people would like people yeah. would like give me their life story about their manual labor job and why they can't train five days a week. Yeah, I wasn't talking to you then. Or like get nine hours of sleep. I can't do that. And it's like yeah. okay, then try and get as much sleep as you can. Yeah, of course. Like <laughs> do the best you can with your schedule. I wasn't talking. Like I'm doing my best yeah. to give broader prescriptions. This isn't coaching. And sometimes I think people like take it personally if it's like this thing is like hypothetically optimal within training, and it's like. Well, I can't do that, and it's like that's fine. But like the goal should be like optimal within the circumstances. Like yeah. it's not like a, as close as you can. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of good mornings, good mornings. That's a good question. Um, because those were tra- that's a that was a trend from like fifteen years ago. Yeah, but those were huge. And you've been was, doing them lately. <laughs> yeah, I do them. I do them. Um, I would say. If we're talking relative to their peak, wildly overrated, okay. would have to be put into dork mode. Yep. Nowadays, probably slightly underrated because I don't see people doing them very much at all. Uh-huh. Uh, de- I don't see people doing them. Depends on what sphere of lifting you're in. Like yeah. if you're like, oh, I, I hang out at Elite FTS. Yeah. You're like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> we all max effort our good mornings every Tuesday, brother. And yeah. it's like, okay. Well, I don't see them very much. Yeah. Um, and they're a very good tool and they probably maybe could even be slightly more represented. So mm. in that way, they're, they're, they're good. I think they could be very overused yeah. for like powerlifting where it's like you have limited low back training economy. Mm. Maybe you want to use that on something that looks more like a deadlift or m- more like a squat. Yeah. Um, and you can see that in the deadlifts of that era. Mm-hmm. They were wicked strong. Yeah. They just weren't good at deadlifting. 
they yeah, dedicated <laughs> so much training to getting their posterior chain unbelievably strong. Yeah. But then this training specificity was very low. Yeah. And the results in the deadlift have skyrocketed since. Yeah. Kabuki bar aside, mm -hmm. sumo deadlifts aside, the results have gotten far better from those multiply deadlifts that were being put up in the West Side era. Part yeah. of that's because they were told that they needed to go to weight classes above where their deadlift could be good. Yeah. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. But part of it is that low specificity, low skill deadlift program is like, yes, you're wicked strong, but you're not very efficient at displaying it. Yeah. Right. And then people are like, you can only deadlift heavy once a month. And it's like, Mike T came around and was deadlifting heavy two to three days per week yeah. and then pulled 840 on a stiff bar. And everybody's like, what is this? You must be cheating and doping. How could you recover from this? Yeah. It's like, well, it's because he's better at deadlifting. So it's like, a more you know, you're training. efficient movement, easier yeah, to recover from. You're okay. training, you're always trying to juggle like, okay, well, I want to build a bigger machine because mm -hmm. using a bigger machine, it's easy to lift more weight. Yeah. Right? But I also want to be good at using that machine. Mm -hmm. I want that machine to be efficient. Yeah. So we're always juggling like build a bigger machine, mm -hmm. get that bigger machine better at squatting, benching, deadlifting, or strongman. Right? right? Um, the, the good morning is a great tool for building the machine. Mm -hmm. Not a very good tool for making it better within like specific skills. Mm. So as long as it's not like, yeah, like I chasing like, like phase you're in. caring about like max effort, good mornings, probably taking something too far. Yeah. Right. You trying to get better from a three to a 12 rep max good morning, probably a great tool that a lot of people could use. Mm. So I would say jock mode nowadays, because I'm kind of thinking like jock mode, dork mode is kind in of rel to is <laughs> relative to like public perception. Yeah. Cause like all of these things could be used other than zoomers. Um, uh, belt squats. Um, they were a real flash in the pan. I remember it was like a yeah. one month period. Dude, guys were posting like, you could not increase your, like they were like doing like stories where they were doing like Q and A stories. People were like, well, what can I do? My gym doesn't have a belt squat. Could I do like deep leg presses? And they're like, it's not the same at all. Give up. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you guys? Yes, a deep, a deep leg press will work. The hack squat will work fine. Like, they're like, no, the specificity of a belt squat can't be matched by a leg press. The specificity of a fucking belt squat is terrible. I remember There's no specificity. <laughs> if anything, in some ways, the, the leg press is more specific because you're actually, you're getting knee extension and hip extension. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you like kind of look at the mechanics of a belt squat, it's very, very knee, set, knee extension centric. Mm -hmm. So it's like, in some ways, a deep leg press is more specific. But I remember like people were like posting like yeah. fucking Chance Mitchell, right? Was yeah. like, no, there's nothing that could substitute. God damn it, dude. Like you're convincing guys with a 405 squat they can't get to 440 without a belt squat? Yeah. Real, I don't know. It's a bummer because I was doing belt squats at the time. And so like in the time of like less than one block of my training, I saw them like become this hype thing. And then everyone would be like, that was actually like really stupid. And it was like, no, they're just a good exercise. That's yeah. like... <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 a good, they're a very good exercise. Right? Yeah. Especially very a lot, guys, <laughs> a lot of guys need to bias towards their knee extensors because yeah. their hip extensors are actually pretty decent. Their knee extensors really need work. Yeah. And it's like, it's a lot of ways, it's kind of like a leg extension mm -hmm. because you know, it's very knee extensor heavy and that's kind of what is going to be the limiting factor, yeah. but with a bigger range of motion and a kind of more relevant strength curve yeah. than a leg extension. They're a great tool. Mm -hmm. And you know, in our program, we always have like some kind of squat pattern movement where mm -hmm. we're not limited by the lower back. Yeah. Some athletes that's gonna be a belt squat. That's a great option. Some athletes that might be a unilateral squat. Mm -hmm. Some athletes that might be a leg press. Yeah. Absolutely, there's some athletes that will get better results on a belt squat than a leg press because they do need that bias toward the knee extensors. Mm -hmm. Right, um, jock mode, great exercise. Yeah. At the time, was overhyped. Nowadays, I think it's fine. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's like rampantly over or underhyped nowadays. Yeah. Uh, overall, very jock mode. Uh, back to zoomers, uh, chain in mouth uh, or something else in your mouth and shysties. Yeah, something else in your mouth for sure, dude. <laughs> if you're listening with a chain in your mouth, <laughs> that was such a weird thing because it was like Russ Swole had yeah, his Russ like was pole. Do, Russ was doing it, and, and then, then just like, out of nowhere, everybody's like in the gym with a fucking chain in their mouth. Like yeah, that dog. was crazy. That was a, a wild a bunch though, of like, sixteen year olds with their dog tags. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. I've never been more glad to stop. That seeing was something. a horrendous. Yeah, that and the shiest. The shiesty might be even worse. Yeah, oh, which the, brings us to the other one we also have, which is the crop top. I really don't know which of those three makes me want to fucking off myself more. Um, I... And I don't have to worry about getting demonetized because all of these are demonetized because the intros, I insist on actually using... Oh, uh, non copyright music? Yeah, yeah. Copy, like, I don't want to use copyright-free music. Very cool. <laughs> Ruin my art. Yeah, oh god. The shiesties kind of go along with the weird spirit Halloween mask TikTok oh. trend. 
where it's just like to do your posing in the gym, you're wearing a little weird outfit. Stop doing that. I know none of our viewers are doing that, hopefully. Uh, no, none of them. None of, these guys are chats. Yeah, they're all, they're all jock mode. These guys so are a bunch of very be. smart, muscular men. Please and buy our merch. Muscular. When we release our sheeter training masks with Ode on them. And then maybe two, <laughs> like two or three very muscular women. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so overall, very, very dork mode. Uh, stop doing that. The wackest shit I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> very grip wits on bench press. Um, that was a really weird one. Yeah, so was, that's like, funny. <laughs> we put this in here because we we're like talking about like lifting trends over time. I was like, do you want to put in one from like the seventies? Because it, it it came back. When was it that people were doing the really heavy? Like maybe five years ago. I'm gonna be honest. I th- it came back again. Like like there was a whole like close grip versus uh, closer grip thing and then like slightly wide past yeah. rings where like it was like less varied than like the 70s where it was like either you grab on the smooth yeah you're going you're, here here or here yeah, you grab the collars you grab the smooth and then uh then there was a trend where it was like you move one finger in or one finger out so it's yeah. like both are kind of the same thing but to different degrees yeah lots so there's of, kind of been three waves of that of like yeah. the 70s and then like 2013 to 2016 and then like once again in 2020 um <laughs> 2020 is four years ago, dude. Oh, sorry. 2022. <laughs> uh, God, but yeah, that was a good thing. Fun. A lot of the routines, if you look back, like in the 70s, there was a lot of use of varied grip to create. Again, we're talking about like, hey, you've got a certain number of sets across the week. But yeah, when we get close to a contest, we probably want to tighten up the specificity and use a lot of those for something very, very similar. But if we know, generally speaking, horizontal pressing, bench press with a bar, we want to do like 15 sets. Again, we can create a little novelty. Three of them are with a close grip. Three of them are with a wide grip. Uh, a lot of the routines back in like the seventies where they were producing insane results mm-hmm. on the bench press. It's like, there's a couple yeah. of results. If you go through open powerlifting that are like before bench suits were invented, like that is as good the as full, we are now. Yeah. The full power benches have just started being beaten again. Finally. Yeah. The reason for this is because guys back then were dedicating a very illogical from a, from a sports perspective, mm. a very illogical amount of their total training economy was going towards getting really jacked in the upper body. Yeah. And that's why the guys in the 70s looked like the guys in the 70s. Yeah. Because they spent a lot of time building their upper bodies. Yeah. And if you look at like the full power bench records from back then, mm. they're highly, highly competitive to this very day. Yeah. The deadlifts have been left in the dust mm. because I like, largely I think improvements in like specificity and understanding and technique. And yeah. The deadlifts have genuinely improved a lot. Mm. Equipment regardless. Yeah. They have come up a lot. The squats kind of a mixed bag in comparison of equipment, but the squats have come up, yeah. right? The bench press has barely improved because guys started dedicating more of their training economy mm-hmm. to the squat and the deadlift, which are bigger parts of the total. Yeah. Uh, they did have benching pretty figured out back then if that's mm-hmm. really what you're interested in. And they would make use of a lot of varied grip work. Mm-hmm. I do like the modern iteration of like, how much wider are we talking? Yeah. Maybe two finger widths yeah. versus like a foot wider. Yeah. Or like how much narrow are we talking? A bit narrower. Yeah. I prefer that training model of mm-hmm. like, again, we got our 15 sets. We're going to break that up. You could even say five, five, and five. Yeah. Five regular, like if we're in kind of an off-season setting, mm-hmm. if we're keeping them closer to our main one, that'll, yeah. that'll work great. That's a great routine. I think that's something that's like interesting is like how many comp sets are you doing, but also proximity to a competition movement is also Yeah, it's like that. Important. You could count that as a set, like a low pause, a deadlift with a low pause. Yeah. Yeah, goddamn. That's basically another comp set. Like, like so, the motor pattern is so eerily similar. Yeah. That it's like, because it's like, like you said, it's like on paper that might be lost if we're not taught if we don't include like that's so close. It's basically there. Yeah, or like, like a two grip finger closer. Yeah. There was a time where I was doing like three total comp bench press sets a week, technically. But it's like one of those is a Yukon bar, and one of those is a closer grip, and then another one is like where like in total I was doing like eighteen sets of bench press a week. But that's because it's like uh, all of them like were very very close, so like the technique carryover was still yeah. really high. Like I built the squat. Yeah. It's not a comp squat. It's still got a, like immense amount of like technical carryover. Yeah. So it probably is like. Yeah, the movement pattern is similar enough that it can kind of be tallied the same way. Yeah. And we can still get some novel adaptations and small novel adaptations in like muscularity, mm-hmm. small novel adaptations in terms of like uh, training effect, mm-hmm. nice novel adaptations in terms of technique, mm-hmm. better understandings of like how your triceps are working. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, remember my Yukon bar? It was like very, very similar, but it was something just different enough that was like allowing me to feel like different parts of the How technique. to stay tight at the bottom. Yeah. 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 Uh, what's what's the next one? We're uh, finishing this bad boy. Speed through these uh, bands and chains. Uh, In the past, horribly dork mode overrated. Yep. Now, jock mode underrated. 
big caveat is like how much band or chain tension are we using? Yeah. A lot of band, a lot of chain, my personal opinion, not great. Yeah. A modest amount of band, a modest amount of chain, mm -hmm. great variation, mm -hmm. kind of shifts muscular emphasis. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking about, we could close on our grip to emphasize our triceps a little bit more, mm -hmm. or we could keep our grip the same and just introduce moderate bands, moderate chains, yeah. and do like the same thing we were kind of looking for with that with that close grip mm -hmm. of biasing towards the triceps a little bit. Yeah. But we actually get to practice our tightness the same way with yeah. the same width grip. Genuinely good tool, probably underutilized. I, mean, I know Mike T has been on about this forever is like this actually isn't a terrible variation mm -hmm. it was just horribly overrated yeah. for a period of time yeah but this is a perfectly reasonable variation to implement in moderation mm -hmm. uh bulking and cutting versus main gaining i don't even know what the consensus is now okay because it was like greg Doucette was like main gaining or whatever the fuck yeah. and then like people were like no you have to bulk or cut to where like i even had someone tell me in my discord that like it wasn't wise ever yeah. to be eating at maintenance. And it's like, well, I'm not a bodybuilder. Even a bodybuilder, I would argue, there's definitely times where eating at maintenance makes perfect sense. Yeah. Like I, do, I don't think there's much research to it, but I do think that there's validity to bulking, holding your peak bulk weight for a little bit mm -hmm. before beginning your cut and just accumulating some training time at this biggest, strongest state. Yeah. And you're seeing your numbers continue to go up, mm -hmm. but you're not getting any fatter. Yeah. But your number are continuing to go up and it's not new exercises. So that's probably indicative of some amount of tissue gain. Mm -hmm. Holding that bulked weight, yeah. um, people seem to retain more muscle on the way down. I don't know how valid that is. Yeah. Um, but even from a bodybuilding perspective, periods of maintenance make sense. Mm. But this guy was like, oh man, there's like from just like a pure efficiency perspective, like why would you ever be not cutting or bulking? It just makes more sense if you're going to gain tissue better this way, mm. you're going to improve body composition better this way. Yeah. It's like, I'm not concerned about, like it's not just purely what is my DEXA scan. Yeah. There's guys who are better than me with worse looking DEXA scans. Yeah. It's more complicated than that. Complicated than that. We are performance athletes. Mm -hmm. Just being able to recover and put in periods of productive training mm -hmm. makes it so, periods of maintenance makes a fuck ton of sense, mm -hmm. right? I think, so so I think either it was main like, gaining or cutting and bulking is like the right and correct one. Very dark mode. Yeah. Like it's- That's it, what I think, it, that's what I think it was, it was a yo-yo, right? Uh -huh. People are like getting fat is stupid. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, getting fat is probably stupid yeah. for the vast majority of people. Yeah. Cause they're just gonna hate how they look. Like people were like brainwashed like, dude, if you gain 50 pounds, even if you gain fat, you're gonna like how you look. No, you won't. Yeah. Like people are like, yeah, you're gonna gain more muscle though. You're not gonna be skinny anymore. And it's like, you don't look good though, which is what most people care about. Most people care about looking good. That was the big thing with like the whole turbo bulking thing. Is that like, you know, if you wanna uh, eat Twinkies and be in bench, try and bench 500, very cool, but like, it's don't so lie to yourself that you're gonna like it. Dork mode to do that and then be like, I hate how I look. Then don't do it. No yeah, one is like, forcing you to. Or like, this isn't like or, like, or then like have an awakening moment where you're like, yeah, powerlifting is stupid. They just tell you to eat Twinkies. No, we fucking didn't. <laughs> that you are an idiot, dude. Oh my like, god. I, no, I now I just train for like you know like functional. I'm not one of those stupid powerlifters. You could have powerlifted without getting morbidly obese, you dumb fuck. That's like one of my, the most dork mode things I see routinely. We have we've gone like, through so many <laughs> generations of people we know doing like <laughs> dreamer bulking. You know, being like, God, powerlifting sucks. I'm fat. Yeah. And then they're like, you, you know, you could cut and keep powerlifting. Like, there's weight classes, they're dots. Yeah. And they're like, no. And then they're just like, I quit powerlifting. It's terrible. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be like, yo, powerlifting is so bad for you. And it's like, yeah, because you were maxing out four times a week and hurt yourself or whatever. But good powerlifting is not like this <laughs> inherently dangerous activity. Like, I just can't, like, it's always crazy to me when someone does a terrible job of powerlifting and then it's like, powerlifting is terrible. Yeah, I'm not super <laughs> in touch with like the YouTube, like, I don't. I don't really, I don't, Paris is a much better feel for what's going on. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm not in the know. Usually I get one of my updates from Paris. Yeah. But like, I think it was like, people were like, awoken to the fact that like, indefinitely bulking is a terrible idea. Yeah. Or even bulking with a huge margin. Yeah. Right. Of like, I'm going to fluctuate 20 to 30% of my body weight. So like a 150 pound guy yeah. doing a 45 pound bulk. Mm rather than bulking within like a 10% up and down, right? Like mm -hmm. 150, come up to 165. Hopefully you come down to 155 and yeah. then up down with a smaller margin. That's yeah. great. But people kind of, I think people straw manned it mm -hmm. and were like big bulks, bad. It's and also then everybody like, was like, re big bulks, bad, main gaining for life. Yeah. And then people are like, main gaining isn't a very, like most people are skinny. If they want to gain muscle, main mm -hmm. gain is not a very good way to do that. Just bulk within a tighter margin. Yeah. This is 
So fucking simple. Guys in the fucking 60s knew this. Mm -hmm. uh, guys in the 50s knew this. To bulk and cut within smaller margins. It's also like the time proximity thing of like the amount of time that you're comfortable dedicating to bulking or cutting should affect the amount that you're gaining. There's a dude that has been messaging me that's been gaining like 30 pounds and then cutting the same 30 pounds. And it's like, if you're doing this in like a six week period, that's beastly. This is the least productive thing I've ever heard. Beastly. <laughs> I think that's, you're just guys, losing and gaining the same amount of fat over and yeah, over. Yeah, some guys are phenomenal at yo-yo dieting where it's like, wow, you can put on weight really fast, but you could also strip weight really fast. Yeah. And just, but it's like so unproductive because you're just returning to the same two weights over and over. Oh my god, uh, uh, Oscar, uh, legend of the channel, uh, one of the craziest things would like, it bulked like 100 pounds and then lost it and like didn't gain any muscle. He gained a little bit of muscle. Oh, so little. <laughs> he took a bunch of steroids, he gained a little bit of muscle. Uh, pause deadlifts. Good. Overall jock Champion. mode. Best, yeah. the best, best variation for sumo deadlifters, period, full stop. Don't pause like, at your knees if you're pulling sumo. If you're pulling sumo, I want, like, you should probably be pausing like a centimeter off the floor. It is great for forcing you to work to maintain your positions, which is a integral skill to sumo. There's a reason a lot of good sumo deadlifters use them. Awesome variation. Conventional also can work really well. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of guys do just ego pause below the knee. Yeah. Some guys, I think, make that work, but it's pretty rare. Yeah. Like uh, Andrew House does like a moderate height pause, and it seems to be working pretty well for him. Yeah. Most guys should be pausing lower yeah. because that's where they lose their positioning. Yeah. You should be challenging the spot where you're losing your positioning in your pull. Yeah, or it's like if, if you're way better at pausing at your knee, probably shouldn't be pausing at your knee unless you have yeah. like a very good training justification for it. Um, fatigued singles. Good, again, probably when they were kind of trendy, people were overusing them in context where it's just not necessary. Because mm. I think that there's a tremendous amount of value in just approaching a weight that is gonna be hard for one and executing it well. Yeah. And I think there's tremendous value in having the tools to make a moderate weight mm -hmm. that, yeah. right? Doing work sets beforehand could work. Mm -hmm. Some guys are head cases and that being hard would fuck with them. Yeah. And so it's not great, but yeah. they should overcome that. Just being able to like, I don't really care what's on the bar. Yeah. I'm gonna execute a hard single. Yeah. Tons of like psychological benefits to it mm -hmm. rather than like thinking like, oh, I always, Hard single is automatically 600. Mm -hmm. Hard single might be 550. We shouldn't have these like uh, better and better athletes usually are less kind of mental about what's on the bar. Mm -hmm. They're just about doing a single. Yeah. Like, I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to do the math. Yeah. Or like you tell them and they're like, that number means nothing. Numbers mean less mm -hmm. in terms of like pre lift thoughts mm -hmm. to better and better lifters. Mm -hmm. Whereas worse lifters approach weights differently mm -hmm. based on what they know is on the bar. Yeah. A good lifter will approach it the same way mm -hmm. and they're like, well, I'm gonna do my list of things. If it goes, it goes. Yeah. No, like it, like it shouldn't change yeah. based on what's on the bar. Whereas like, this is 405, I should treat it differently. Exactly, than I and it should, yeah. yeah, that shouldn't be a thought process. Yeah. Right, exactly, and so it's like better lifters are like kind of whatever. With like, yeah, PRs mean a lot to them because they're very hard to come by. Yeah. And the fact that they're sticking it out when lifting has gotten so hard to get PRs, mm -hmm. clearly the PRs mean a lot. Yeah. But as far as like actual like emotional response to numbers on the bar, mm -hmm. it goes down and down and down. And I think that's honestly like, it's just another tool kind of for that toolbox of like, no, we're just getting good at executing your cues for mm -hmm. a single. Weight is almost something that just like fluctuates, right? Yeah. Cause it's like, I think newer lifters expect 600 to always feel the same. Cause they're like, I'm weaker than I was last week. Yeah. No, you're not yeah. you're fatigued. Yeah. And a good lifter understands that 600 is going to feel heavy or feel good kind of variable with fatigue. So yeah. it's not actually 600 isn't the difficulty because mm. your hypothetical max on the day fluctuates. Yeah. So it's like 600 isn't the difficult. Mm. The RPE is the difficult. Mm. Um, I don't know. I digress on uh, jock mode, but I don't think most people actually need to make use of them. It's a little bit normie mode. No, I do jock mode. I just don't oh. think that like, I don't know, if, if suddenly everybody we knew was doing them, I'd be yeah. like, that's a bit needless. Yeah. But I think they're a good tool. They make oh, sense. Right. They're a cool idea. Yeah. And there, there's some cool ideas that just like practically is like, okay, that's a fun thought. Like the progressive range of motion that love print training program. Yeah. Of like, okay, well, we're going to keep a fixed weight and we're going to progress range of motion instead of progressing load or progressing volume. Yeah. It's, it's a really cool thought. There's a bunch of old programs on the internet from like forums mm -hmm. that were like amazingly cool thought experiments. Yeah. Of like, what if I used a different overload parameter yeah 
They're, but, they're, don't do that. In practicality. There's a reason yeah. we've kind of gravitated towards some of the things that are con- considered like conventional. Yeah. They're cool ideas. Yeah. Uh, the mind calendar. Chalk for Tell them! <laughs> alright, I realized I didn't want to end on fatigued singles, even though this is a very yeah, long video. Yeah, that would have been a fucking dud. Yeah, alright, so I'm going to explain the mind calendar for you guys. So, uh, early on, I was changing coaches, and uh, I was like, Sam, I'm just going to coach myself, uh, of course. So, I got a composition notebook, and I sat down, and I wrote what would later be dubbed the mind calendar program. Which was basically, uh, exercises were rotating on a, I'm just going to make up a number, like a four week cycle. I remember accessories. a bunch of them. Okay. He, basically how it was is like he would, he, it's kind of similar to like GZCLPL, GZCL, uh, sorry, I'm blanking on it. Very popular program. Just in the fact that there's like tier one, tier two, tier three. Yeah. So Max basically just devised like a tier system of like. First is the tier one exercise, which is going to be squats. Yep. Then tier two, I think we were doing already like kind of a higher frequency model, so maybe it was a deadlift variation. Yep. yep. Uh, and then tier three was like a bodybuilding movement or something, right, or a variation. Yep. So uh, the tier one uh, didn't like, it would rotate within your 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 week, right? Obviously, because mm-hmm. it's like squat Monday. Those were the same every seven days. Uh, the tier two for your like second accessory would rotate on like a four week or so. So it's yeah. like one week you do pause deadlifts, the I, next week you do. I remember that was the craziest part of the whole thing was like, you're like, okay, I'm running a 10 week training cycle. Yep. So I've got a 10 week rotation for tier one. Yep. And you're like, so then I'm going to rotate every three weeks. I was yep. like, three doesn't even fit into 10. Yep. So it's going to be truly random. Yep. And then three uh, week rotation for tier two. Yep. And then four week rotation for tier three. Yep. And then the sets and reps were also r- rotating, but to roughly peak with the block. Um, but that way it's like you were only doing the same exercise with the same sets and reps like once a block. It wouldn't even work out to that. Um, it would be way less common because three does not fit into 10 squarely. So this comes the mind calendar because we have like the inner circle and the outer circles are all rotating at different like- I think we could make a sick like website where like you like rotate a day and you can see like the outermost circle is like tier one. Yeah. So it's like tells you what your squats are. Yeah. And then it tells you what your RDLs are on like a smaller rotating wheel. Yeah. And then the tier three is like a three week rotating wheel. Which to be honest, like, like spit out a workout for you. I think we could put some sick graphics if we knew how to make websites. We got we got a, like a lot of a variety if you're like, oh my training is getting stale. No, Introduce the mind you calendar. You'll not be doing the exact same session for like a year. Every single session is gonna be slightly different. So it's like, oh damn, doing Eats for it's like well this today you're doing two sets of nine instead on a slightly different movement. Uh, I remember Max, Max Lee Kennedy's like dude I, I I wrote myself a program he's like she was explaining he's like this one rotates every two weeks this one rotates every three weeks I was like holy fuck Max so I, I you know I was planned out and so everything's rotating everything's new but it's all progression baby uh, uh, the next one after the. <laughs> <laughs> the I Megalodon mean, program is going to be the Mayan calendar. calendar program, pay 20 bucks I don't even think, book. I don't think you even ran the Mayan calendar because I think I saw the Mayan calendar and was like, I'll write you a program. I ran the Mayan calendar for two weeks. So <laughs> I, <laughs> before you were like, stop doing that all, which I think Sam was trying to throttle my progress because I... Ima- imagine, dude, you would be absolutely mogging Jesus right now had you been doing a decade of the Mayan calendar. I might have, I might have come back and done one full circle to the same week again. <laughs> <laughs> Across the last 10 years, I would have finally looped the Mayan calendar program once. On the uh, 200th block, the world ends. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, guys. Uh, oh, I, I could have I tr- sold that. That would have been trendy. I, people like gimmicks. Dude, All you, right, guys. you can still sell the Mayan calendar. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, tune in next time. Love you guys. <laughs>